So uh, welcome back. So the uh, second talk of the workshop, uh, and unfortunately, quite a few subsequent talks given by myself. And I'll, uh, is the sound on? It, it's not broadcasting your voice, so yeah, it's on. Great. And then, uh, yeah, so I'll talk about these more recent developments in fractal uncertainty principle and its applications. <coughs> so let me <coughs> oh, give, a, I see, give some overview. So I will present a couple of uh, recent results in quantum chaos, a field that was uh, masterfully introduced by Stefan Neumacher this morning. And the central new ingredient is a tool from harmonic analysis, really, that uh, I call the fractal uncertainty principle. <coughs> and it will be quite a while in the slides until we get to the exact, to precise statement of even some version of that. So I'll state it very vaguely on the first slide. It just says that no function can be localized in both position and frequency near a fractal set. By contrast, the usual uncertainty principle says that no function can be localized in both position and frequency near one point. So it's an, in some sense an extension of the usual uncertainty principle. Now the proofs of the results I'll present use tools from several different fields. So one of them is microlocal analysis, which is uh, really a mathematical theory behind the uh, classical to quantum correspondence or geometric wave approximation or particle wave correspondence, for that matter. Uh, it also uses uh, a lot of tools from hyperbolic dynamics. So in some sense, quantum chaos can be obtained when you combine the two together with the uh, hyperbolic dynamics giving you the chaotic behavior of the classical system and microlocal analysis translating this chaotic behavior, saying what does this chaotic behavior of the underlying classical system imply for the corresponding quantum system. Now the fractal uncertainty principle itself requires tools from two additional fields. One is fractal geometry. And fractal sets here will actually naturally appear from dynamical questions. I'm, I'm not going to just make up a fractal set. It will actually be enforced by a problem. And harmonic analysis. So these four fields are combined together to give you these results. And also, since this is not a regular conference, it's an emerging topics workshop, I would like to notice that despite our recent results, there are still many open problems that remain. And uh, well, we're hoping to address them this week. All right. So, well, let me start with a primitive statement that uh, can just be put uh, without any extra definitions. And then I will get to more advanced versions, which are, however, not really harder to prove than the version on this board. So I'm going to consider a compact hyperbolic surface. So to me, it's a classical model of uh, classical chaos. Why? Because if I consider a geodesic flow on this surface, it's a very standard example of something with uh, hyperbolic behavior or something that has a stable and stable decomposition, as uh, Stefan explained this morning. So it has a very unstable behavior, this geodesic flow. And so a standard question in quantum chaos is to consider eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on this uh, surface and study their behavior. So that's, uh, that's one of the standard uh, questions in quantum chaos, and uh, that's the one that, uh, you know, that we'll address here. All right. So, uh, well, here's a theorem. Let's fix an arbitrary non-empty open set inside of your hyperbolic surface. Then the L2 normalized eigenfunction actually has a lower bound in L2 on this set. So we have a lower bound on the mass of the eigenfunction on this open set, where the constant in the lower bound depends on the manifold, certainly depends on the choice of the open set omega, but does not depend on the frequency. So here's a simple statement. So I'd like to start with a kind of simple statement about just um, Laplacian for hyperbolic surfaces. Now, I should note that for bounded lambda, this is immediate from unique continuation principle simply because u solves an elliptic uh, PD. So really, the new information here is about the high frequency limit. Lambda goes to infinity, and that's the limit that quantum chaos studies. So 
now I should uh, also put a word of warning that you know the statement looks very simple but you do need to involve some structure at least some structure of the surface what we will use is the structure of the geodesic flow but this statement will not be true for uh, any given surface let's say not a hyperbolic surface for instance if my M instead was a sphere and I take omega which is uh, just a small ball somewhere here say the omega that I drew then you can find a sequence of eigenfunctions which localize let's say to this equator and in particular their norm on omega their mass on omega is going to be exponentially small in frequency and certainly doesn't have a lower bound so in order to prove this statement we will need to actually invoke some global properties of the geodesic flow on this manifold and so that's why it's uh, really a really quantum chaotic not no we well i don't know it's uh, we, we certainly need to invoke more than that Hmm? On, on the flat torus, it's true, but for a different reason. The more advanced statement that I'll write in uh, localization, position, frequency is actually not true. It's true, but for, uh, for number theoretic reasons. Yes, it was proved by Jafar, I believe. Even there, you can... I'll, I'll talk about the torus a little bit more, actually. I'll, I'll mention the torus in one of the next slides then, and then we'll see what the difference is. But yes, literally, this specific statement does happen to be true on the flat torus, rational or not. All right. Yeah, rationality actually has nothing to do with the proof for the torus, I think. All right. So now what I want to do is, um, in order to understand the proof, I will actually need to formulate a stronger statement, which in some sense is a more natural statement to prove. So the statement on the previous slide was about the lower bound on the L2 norm in a given open set, which you can think of as localizing your eigenfunction in position and then looking what the resulting mass is. Now what we can do is we can actually localize more. We can localize in both position and frequency. And this localization is part of this theory called microlocal analysis. And the way it is achieved, well, there are several ways, but the way that I'll use is by uh, quantizing classical observables. So what you can do is you can take any, well, I'm, I'm going to, this, I have to say, this slide will have quite a bit of technical lies. So the microlocal analysts in the audience can, you know, delight in finding all the mistakes there. But I claim that n none of these lies actually matter for the ending message and they'll, uh, this way we're not gonna sink in technical details. So if I take a function on the co tangent bundle. So I take the function of position and this xi variable, which is a cotangent vector, and it will be identified later with frequency, uh, or momentum of your uh, classical system. Then I can quantize it and obtain an operator that acts on functions on m. Formally, it's uh, done as follows. You just take your symbol a, your classical observable, and then you replace this momentum variable with h over i times a differential operator, so just partial x. Of course, this do doesn't make sense unless this was, say, a polynomial in xi, in which case you would get a differential operator. So this needs to be defined in some more complicated way that I will spare you. But um, what happens is, for instance, if you quantize just the function xj on Rn, you just get multiplication operator by xj. And if you quantize, say, the function xi j, you will get h over i times the differentiation by xj. So I should say y h. So this is a, a maybe a point to mention that uh, all of these operators, all of these quantized observables, they de de depend on this parameter h. And this is a physical, I guess it, it was Planck constant, but here we are, we're not talking about any particular physical application. So it's just a small parameter. And it's the effective wavelength of your system. So if you had a function that, OK, I see. I should have erased that. If you had a function that oscillates at frequency about h inverse, so the wavelength of this function is about h, when you differentiate that, you will get an h inverse times, uh, you know, times something bounded. So if you take h times the differentiation of this function, this will give you something of roughly the same size. So this h is just the correct coupling constant, which would correspond to studying functions which oscillate at scale at, um, you know, which oscillate at wavelength about h. That's it. All right. So this quantization procedure, it turns out, 
enjoys a lot of nice properties and in fact that's what makes microlocal analysis a powerful tool because it converts certain questions in PD which are questions about operators or solution of uh, partial differential equations to questions in algebra to questions about constructing functions on the cotangent space so on the phase space which enjoy certain properties which is easier to do so here are some nice properties products of operators modular low order terms correspond to multiplying the corresponding classical observables adjoints correspond to taking the complex conjugate of the observable commutators that's why it's called quantization perhaps commutators correspond to taking the Poisson bracket of the two classical observables so that's how microlocal analysis somehow the uh, non-commutative property of operators on uh, on functions on M corresponds to taking the Poisson bracket, so corresponds effectively to the symplectic structure of T star M. And that's why symplectic geometry, local symplectic geometry, is important for this business. And again, here I emit a bit of a lie, but roughly speaking, bounded operators, so bounded classical observables, when quantized, give you operators that are bounded in L2 uniformly in H. So it's really a nice, uh, you know, a nice language where a lot of uh, algebraic properties can be translated to the operator side. Well, how does it have to, you know, how, how does it relate to our original problem? Well, actually, if I look at this equation, this eigenvalue equation, and as I said, we are studying this eigenvalue equation at high frequency. So I call this frequency lambda, and uh, the corresponding eigenvalue is lambda squared. So it's very large. What you can do is you can do some trivial rescaling. You can just say, let's say if my frequency is lambda, then my wavelength should be like 1 over lambda. So you put your frequency to be equal to 1 over lambda. And then you rescale this equation to obtain this. And now you see that the operator in this resulting equation is nothing but a quantization of a certain symbol. Because now we have h's next to derivatives like there. And what's the corresponding symbol? Well, there is this minus 1, and for convenience uh, purposes, I will square it. But really, it's just given by the norm that the metric induces on the fibers. So in fact, that's something that's not hard to check. A modular low order terms, which I didn't write here, is that if you look at the Laplace Beltrami operator in a Riemannian manifold, the principal part of it, the second order terms, looks like the inverse, you know, the length square inverse of, with respect to uh, the metric times second order derivatives and that's uh, that's all that is included in the statement so this p square will exactly you know encode this matrix okay so we started with this high frequency eigenfunction problem and now we got some function which is in the kernel of this semi-classical pseudo differ well semi-classical differential operator so that's nice to remember now let me formulate a micro local version of uh, uh, this theorem one of the control of eigenfunctions theorem so the statement is the following. So here is, I'll start with a general elliptic estimate. So we saw before that this quantization of observables enjoys this very nice property that the product of two quantized observables is like quantizing the product of the corresponding symbols plus low order terms. Well, of course, once you multiply what's the next, uh, what's, what's the operation I haven't mentioned uh, before on this slide, you want to divide. And so it turns out that if you have two classical observables, so two functions in T star M, and the support of one of these functions, B, is contained where the function A is not equal to 0, then, well, you can just write up H of B is equal to up H of B divided by A, and that's well defined, times up H of A plus low order terms. And you can iteratively resolve the low order terms. And then when you apply this simple identity to any function, what you see is that for any function, if you localize it using this operator up H of B, it's actually bounded by the result of localizing it using this up H of A plus a lower, you know, plus a rather small remainder. H infinity means it decays faster than any power of H. All right. <clears throat> so you see that this... Um, this pseudo-differential algebra, or this um, quantization, it really lets you understand what it means for a function to be small or large 
not just in a region of the physical space, but in the position frequency space, because you could take a classical observable, which is supported in some small region in both x and psi variables, and quantize it, and then apply it to your function. And if this is small, then you can say that your function is small in the corresponding region of the phase space, so the cotangent bundle. So this uh, makes it possible for us to talk about localization of functions in both position and frequency. And there are lots of other ways to think about it. You can take the Fourier transform of a localized function, but that's a particularly neat way to do it. So in particular, what we can see is that if we go back to the second function problem, what we knew is that op h of p squared minus 1 times u was equal to 0. And so if you look at this general elliptic estimate, you see that it tells you that op h of bu is going to be very small as long as support of b doesn't intersect the set where this p squared minus 1 is equal to 0. Of course, the set, however, is just the cosphere bundle. So what this tells you is that if you try to take an eigenfunction and you localize it using some symbol which is supported away from the cosphere bundle, then you get something small. So this is the same as uh, was mentioned in the morning's lecture, that eigenfunctions in the high frequency limit are localized in position frequency to cosphere bundle. Or if you want to think of it in applied math terms, they oscillate roughly on scale 1 over h. <coughs> All right, so this is a standard statement. Well, so what's the microlocal version of um, the result? It tells you that basically there is a converse for that statement. So if you try to localize your function away from the cosphere bundle, then you get something very small. Well, what if you try to localize it to some small piece which somehow touches the cosphere bundle? Well, then you get a lower bound. So this is an extension of theorem 1, which tells you that uh, let's say I have some classical observable. And the only condition that I require that its restriction to the cosphere bundle is not identically 0. So it has at least one point in S theorem where this symbol is not 0. Then for any high frequency eigenfunction, I have a lower bound on the norm of this op h of a applied to u. So if a was just a function of x, which is not identically 0, then this condition is automatically satisfied. And then we would see that the, you, you have a lower bound of, on the norm of AU, which is the same as having a lower bound on A localized on any given non-empty non open set. So if you just uh, plugged in here functions which depend only on position but not on the uh, frequency variable, then you would get back the uh, original theorem one. But this is a more advanced version. What do you have to assume about U here? Oh, that U is an eigenfunction yeah, in high frequency. Right. So by the way, oh, here I can talk about the torus. So theorem 1 is true for the flat torus. This statement is certainly provably false for the flat torus. Because for a flat torus, you, you can have an eigenfunction that, for example, looks like e to the i x 1 divided by h, or e to the i x 2 divided by h. And if you look at the function e to the i x 1 divided by h, it lives everywhere in position, but it only lives on the vector 1, 0 in frequency. So effectively, you know, the torus is a, is a completely integrable system, the geodesic flow. And it's a known fact that the eigenfunctions for that, they, they would uh, generically, they, they would live on the uh, Liouville tori for the system, which are a much smaller set than the entire STRM. So this statement would certainly be false for the torus. And uh, as before, for the sphere. So, all right, so let me uh, give another application of this theorem one, or re really an another interpretation of it, in terms of semi classical measures that were introduced this morning. So, I'll go very briefly through this since th this has already happened. So, if you have, uh, you know, if, if, uh, you know it's, 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 it's nice to study not just localization of a, of a given function. But if, if you want to talk about a limiting measure, you need a high frequency sequence of eigenfunctions with eigenvalues going to infinity. So that's what I do here. And then you can uh, try to extract a weak limit. So you say that this sequence converges to a measure. And what this means is that if you try to test this sequence by a quantized classical observable, it converges to the integral of the, uh, of the corresponding symbol over some measure. 
So there is a compactness property. You can always extract a subsequence that converges to some measure. And so the set of all possible measures that you can obtain as these weak limits of, um, of uh, you know, if you want, of Wigner measures of these eigenfunctions are called semi-classical measures. All right. So we've uh, seen this before. And then these semi-classical measures, they enjoy certain basic properties. So you, any, any resulting measure is going to be a probability measure. This localization statement, I said before, corresponds to the fact that its support is in the cosphere bundle. What's uh, particularly important is that the resulting measure actually is invariant under the geodesic flow. So the geodesic flow, you can think of it as a flow on the cosphere bundle. Um, that's true for any Riemannian manifold. And you get something that's invariant under the geodesic flow, which is where you start to see why the structure of the geodesic floor, the global structure, will be important to actually understand what these limits do. Then, well, what are the possible invariant measures on the cosphere bundle of a hyperbolic surface? Well, there is a very natural candidate which is the Liouville measure, which is basically the volume measure, just correctly rescaled or with the correct coefficient to make it invariant under the geodesic flow. And if our sequence of functions converges to the Liouville measure in this sense, we say that it equidistributes, which means that in the high frequency limit, the volume or the, the mass of the eigenfunction in a certain region of phase space becomes proportional to the volume of this region. So in particular, if you just look on the physical space, this equidistribution would imply that the weak limit of the measure absolute value uj squared d volume is just the probability rescaled volume measure. So somehow the mass of your function is distributed everywhere evenly. So this is one of these fundamental uh, large scale properties of uh, eigenfunctions that were um, mentioned in the morning. Well, of course, there are plenty of other invariant measures and this condition itself doesn't exclude, for example, that we could be concentrating or we could be converging to just a delta measure on a single closed trajectory, of which there are plenty on a hyperbolic surface. <coughs> and if this happens, we say that our situation is scarring. So it turns out it doesn't happen. But from what's said on this slide, it's not, it's, it's, it's not clear at all why this scarring phenomenon can't occur. Why, why, why can't... Uh, sequence of high frequency eigenfunctions just localized on a single closed trajectory. And as uh, the pictures that Stefan showed uh, illustrated, in some other cases, there are actual numerics and mathematical results that you might actually have no equidistribution for some sequence of eigenfunctions. Do you also address the LP property? Or no. So this, all, 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 all of this is going to be entirely L, L, L2 based theory. Oh. All right. So, all right, so how do you translate this result uh, that I mentioned to the setting of semi-classical measures? Well, here I just review. We have a high-frequency sequence of eigenfunctions. This is a definition of what it means to converge to a measure uh, for this high-frequency sequence. And that is what uh, theorem 1 prime told us. So from these three lines, it's uh, not hard to derive this theorem 1 double prime, which just says the following. If any semi, you take any semi-classical measure on M, then its support is equal to the entire cosphere bundle. That's the theorem. The, the support equal to the entire cosphere bundle is the same, that it's positive on every non-empty non open set, and that translates to our theorem 1 prime. So that's a. Uh, so uh, well, yes, I suppose it's a little bit weaker, but it's really. Um, we, we, we don't have, we have some quantitative dependence, but we don't have a very great dependence on how this depends on the size of the support of A. So if you take a measure of a very small set, it can be very tiny, or at least we cannot exclude that. You know, if you, if you could replace this constant by the volume, then you would get what's known as quantum ergodicity. But there is, I, I, I don't see how this method would give that. Right, the bound is uniform for all the semi-classical measures. That's right. So that is, yes. So strictly speaking, theorem 1 prime is a bit stronger than theorem 1 double prime, yes, I suppose. You, you, you could probably try to alternate things and get compactness. But, I'll, I'll, but in, in any case, we're, b b b both are true. <laughs> and one implies the other. And since both are true, I suppose the other one implies the first one too. But 
Uh, so let me, since uh, St Stefan already, you know, uh, has um, that done, done a great job to talking about the, the history of these problems, I'll just give a brief overview. So the quantum ergodicity theorem tells you that you would have a distribution for a density one sequence of eigenfunctions. So all the other questions are about what happens at the rest. Okay, can there be some exceptional sequence? A quantum unique ergodicity conjecture says that everything has to equidistribute. And so far, that has only been proved in the arithmetic case uh, with these additional symmetries of Hecke operators. What has been done, however, is there was, an, uh, there was proved an entropy bound on the possible semi-classical limits. And the strongest one is, I believe, in uh, the paper of Anand Tarman and Nonemasher for the hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, that's the strongest one. And it uh, tells you that the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy of any semi-classical limiting measure is at least one half. <coughs> so it's a rather clean statement. So the entropy was uh, defined this morning, but it's a notion of how complicated the measure is or how spread out the support is, if you want. So by comparison, the Liouville measure has entropy one and the measure on closed trajectory has entropy zero. So if you think about the comparison between this entropy bound and theorem one double prime, they both lie between quantum ergodicity and quantum unique ergodicity in the sense that unlike quantum ergodicity, they talk about the whole sequence of eigenfunctions. Neither of them gives you quantum unique ergodicity by far, <laughs> but they give you some restriction of how if eigenfunctions do uh, do not equidistribute, it still gives you some bounds on how badly it can happen. So what are the possible limiting measures? <coughs> and as far as the comparison between these two statements, they are somewhat orthogonal to each other. So there exists measures excluded by one of these statements and not excluded by the other one. And in particular, since I'm you know, going to advertise this theorem, uh, there do exist lots of uh, flow invariant measures which have entropy bigger than a half, in fact, as close to one as you want, but their support is not the whole cosphere bundle. In fact, you can make them ergodic. So you, you really, you know, you, you really have a, a, you know, there, there are quite a few things that are excluded by this support property and would still uh, satisfy the entropy bound. And the, the other way around is also true. There are things that satis do not satisfy the entropy bound but have full support. Hmm? Hmm. Good, so I think I'm, I'm done with theorems, I think. Am I? Great. So done. Well, well there, there's not going to be any new theorems for a while now. Now we're just going to do proofs. Uh, well, I don't know if people will be happy about that. So anyway, so that's, the, that's a brief overview of what uh, the result gives you. I should also say that, of course, this setting of hyperbolic surfaces, it's a particular case of more general uh, classical chaotic systems and uh, a lot of these other results are true as, as you know as was stated by Stefan in much higher generality and uh, however this result so far has only been proved for hyperbolic surfaces so that's something I should mention all right so how do we do the proof so let me talk a little bit about <coughs> some of the techniques in the proof <coughs> so this is just uh, the first line is just to review we have this uh, eigenfunction with eigenvalue h to the minus 2 and then we have this observable. So we have the way in which we're localizing it. And the only condition is that it's not identically zero on the cosphere bundle. Now, I'm going to argue micro-locally. What do I mean by this here? Is that I'm going to, instead of, you know, well, what I need is I need a lower bound on this quantity, up h of a u. Well, this is the same as bounding the total norm of u, which is L2 normalized, in terms of this quantity, right? That, that's the same statement. And you can afford to put a small remainder, in fact, with some power of h, but you know, something that goes to 0 as the frequency goes to infinity. So that's uh, just a rewriting of the original theorem uh, 1 prime. Now, instead of controlling all u together, I'm going to split my phase space into pieces. pieces. So I'm going to write this norm of u as the uh, identity operator applied to u. And then I'm going to split the identity operator using a partition of unity into quantized observables where the corresponding symbols lie in some small regions of phase space. So the idea being that you, you're not going to estimate the whole u at once. Instead, you just break your phase space into pieces and you estimate u in different pieces of phase space using, say, different parameters in your problem or potentially using different methods. So that's what I'm going to do. So 
to that effect, I say, so this is some abuse of notation because my set will depend on the frequency. So you actually, when proving that, you, you do need to be careful about what you mean here. But I'll be somewhat sloppy here. So the, uh, you know, in, in, in the, there's going to be a lot of details presented tomorrow. So if somebody's interested in details, there will be more technical talks tomorrow on that. That I'll say that if I, if I take some open set in my phase space in TSTRM, I say that my U is controlled if... I can control, you know, if, if, if uh, for any symbol supported in V, if I localize U using this symbol, I can control it, you, you know, via this right-hand side. And my goal is to show that my U is controlled everywhere because then I can take the identity operator here and I'll be done. And if U is controlled on two sets, then it's controlled on the union by just taking a partition of unity. So that's what I'm going to be using implicitly. Now, okay, where do we have control on U? It's controlled on the complement of the cosphere bundle. That's the solipticity statement we had before. Because if we localize u away from the cosphere bundle, we just get something really small. We don't even need this other term. Well, you allow a very small. Yeah, but you're, you're not giving that lower bound on uh, a u, right? The, well, at the end, what happens is. is that's right. Well, that's right. So the idea is to control it everywhere. So once you control it everywhere, so piece by piece, you can nice. piece this together, and then you control the, the total norm of u, and then the remainder can be removed. No, but that, that's a very valid point. That's right. You have to control everything, otherwise you, 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 know, you cannot remove this remainder. That's right. So then, uh, well, u is also controlled where a is not equal to 0. That's this ellipticity statement we had before. Because then op of bu is controlled by op of au. Because you can divide B by A. That's, the, that's this argument we had before that I uh, erased there. Now, uh, well, if A was non-zero everywhere on the cosphere bundle, then we would be done. But of course, that, that wouldn't be an interesting statement. So in order to push uh, further, we need to uh, start using the geodesic flow. And how does the geodesic flow relate to these eigenfunctions of the Laplacian? Well, through the wave group. So I'm going to use the half-wave propagator, which is just this unitary family of operators. And then, since my u is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian, it's also an eigenfunction of this wave group. And thus, if I look at the norm of up h of a u, I can for free insert u of minus t here. And I can insert this uh, wave propagator here, because I just, it just, just gives me a constant. So the norm of op h of a u is the same as applying to u the uh, conjugated operator. So you can, you see, by this, you know, this right-hand side not only controls this, it actually controls any conjugated operator applied to u, where you conjugate by the wave group. Now, it turns out that this conjugated operator by Yegorov's theorem actually is modular low-order terms the quantization of the original symbol A propagated by the geodesic flow. And so that's where the geodesic flow comes into the picture on a technical level. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a way to quantify geometric optics. It just tells you that if your wave function was localized somewhere, and then you propagate it by the half-wave propagator, then at later times it's going to be localized in the result of taking the classical evolution and applying it to this uh, you know, set set where it was localized originally. So waves, uh, wa waves at high frequency approximately propagate along straight lines. That's a less fancy way of saying that. Except our straight lines are geodesics, but, but well, our waves are like that. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, so this is a geodesic flow. And so what this tells you is that you can actually control your function not only so if I draw this kind of funny blob, S star M, it's a 3D manifold. I don't know how to draw it. It's a circle bundle of a, a Riemann surface. <laughs> then here is my A not equal to 0. That's where I control my function originally. Then I can propagate this A not equal to 0. And I'll control my function here as well. Or if you want, if I had some point, x and xi, maybe that's a better way of thinking about this. If I look at the geodesic, phi t of x xi, if at some point in time, if at some time it crossed this original hole, this original control region, then I can control my u in a neighborhood of this point. 
so as you can guess now, understanding the set of things that are not controlled uh, is going to be important. Now, there is a significant caveat here. Namely, I can actually make my time depend on the frequency. For bounded time, this is not hard to see. But in fact, you can run it for a rather long time, up to um, either twice or once, depending on who you ask, the so-called Ehrenfest time, which is basically like logarithm of the frequency. And the reason for that, so why, why specifically this number, is because if I look at Yegorov's theorem, this side is not a problem. Proving Yegorov's theorem actually only takes about two lines. The problem is really our ability to quantize the symbol. And so as Stefan explained in the morning, if you start with something that's very localized, or something localized in some A, and then you propagate for a long time because the flow is hyperbolic, it will become rather thin in certain directions. And once this thinness passes the Planck constant, the standard uncertainty principle prevents us from having any good sense of localization. So the point of, of this slide is that we're just using this classical quantum correspondence as much as we can. And this is a natural limit for how long we can still propagate a classical observable and still be able to make sense of it in, in the sense of being localized in some region in phase space. All right. Well, so we, 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 we control our U actually in a lot of places. That's great. Well, not everywhere. So now we have to think, well, what's, what's left? So this is, this is as much as microlocal analysis can get us. This is uh, classical quantum corresponding to its limit. Though you can see that you can do it both forwards and backwards in time. Well, so this is just a review here. Well, what this means is that the places where U is not controlled are points so that the corresponding trajectory doesn't go through the hole for this log of 1 over h time. And you can do it both forwards and backwards in time. So it turns out that you cannot make sense of localization both forwards and backwards in terms of semi-classical quantization. It's a subtle point that I'm not really going to explain in details why here, but that's something that we'll actually benefit from. But you can make sense of it separately. So you can write your u as something that's controlled plus u, which is localized to the sets gamma plus minus of h, which just consists of points uh, which do not visit the hole for a very long time, so do not visit where A is not equal to zero, for a very long time, either forward or backwards in time. All right. Now let's look at what do these sets look like. So using hyperbolicity of this flow, and unique ergodicity of horror cycle flows does come in handy here. Not strictly speaking needed, but it's nice to use here. It turns out that the sets have a lot of structure. So if we go back to the stable and stable decomposition of our STRM, it turns out that our sets one of our sets is very smooth in the unstable direction and rather rough, so porous. I'll define porosity on the next slide in the stable direction. And the other set with the other direction of time propagation is the same, but with the stable and stable directions reversed. So I will give some definitions and um, do something, but it's actually nice to show a picture, especially it's, uh, you know, it's 512, so it's, it's a good, good time to switch to pictures. <laughs> So it's a little bit tricky for me to model this uh, flow on the hyperbolic surface because it's 3D and it's also kind of, it's more complicated and I didn't have much time. What is easy to do is to uh, do this Arnold cat map model, which was uh, mentioned this morning, which is also has a stable and stable direction. And so I'm just going to use that to, uh, ju just for figure purposes. All right. So here's a, here's a cat. Don't quite see. Yes, it's, it's, it's a black cat in this black triangle. But what happens is this white set is where A is uh, not equal to 0. So that's this hole that I drew. So my cat map, it's on, it's on a square. Right? And then the black stuff is stuff that's not controlled yet. And then I'm going to dial up the time. And I see what do we have that's not controlled yet, either in positive or in negative time. You know, at each new iteration, we will take out some points. So this would be the points which, after kth iteration, they will hit the hole. And I'll have forward and backward in time. Oh, bah. So if you do it for one step, then you see that these are exactly the points which were, okay, they were not in the hole, but when you apply the cat map once, they will end up here. And so that's why they are controlled. And there it's the same, but backwards. But now I can dial it up. I can get this. And then I can get this. And then I can get this. And I believe I can even, yes, the resolution lets me do that. 
So this is a numerically computed sets of points which are still not controlled, either forward or backwards in time. And now you can see that this is the stable direction. This is the unstable direction. Indeed, they're very smooth in the stable direction. And the very porous, so they have a lot of holes on different, uh, you know, on different scales in the unstable direction. And the other side is the same, but the roles of the directions are reversed. Well, it makes sense because the time direction is reversed. OK, so that's the, that's the picture that we have arrived to. So this is the places where you know, we, we control you on complement of this, so on white things here and on white things there. Or if you want, you can think of u as being localized to this set plus controlled or localization to this other set plus controlled. These localizations are this up h of b plus minus. Well. The black ones, yes. Yeah, so everything here are this. So these are the supports of B plus minus. So these are things that are still not controlled. Even, you know, we already spoke for like, you know, half an hour about that and still not controlled. Well, we are, we, we are about to kill the sets that are not controlled yet. So here I see that there is nothing that prevents me from taking the product of these two operators. From a point of view of semi-classical analysis, this is ridiculous. This is not going to give you a quantization of an observable. But... Um, but that's what's going to help us, in fact. So you can write your u as a product of these two localizing operators. One localizes here, one localizes there, plus something controlled. And then uh, we have this porosity property that I mentioned. And uh, here is a strict definition. There is some new which depends on the size of the, on, on the manifold and on the choice of the holes on, on, on the function a. So this is where we use that our observable is not identically 0 on the cosphere bound, or, or that there are, there are a hole, there are a set where we get lower bounds is not empty. So if the set is very small, then nu will be very close to 0. That these sets, they have this porosity property, one only in the stable direction, another in the unstable direction. And the porosity property for subsets of R uh, is just the following. If you take an interval of a sensible length, so 1 is, well, 1 is like that. And h is like the distance between these two things here, basically. Then you can find a subinterval of relative size nu, which doesn't intersect your set. So if I zoom into my set at any intermediate scale between h and 1, I'll always be able to find a subinterval of nice relative size that's going to miss my set. So it has a lot of holes. That's what it means. But you really use it at all points at all scales. Right. So well, it turns out that this product as I said, is not a quantization of an observable. And there is a good reason for that, uh, because these localizations are incompatible. Because you're trying to localize and, you know, to a width h neighborhood of the stable direction with h neighborhood of the unstable direction. If you think of it, localization, position, momentum, that's what I'll do on the next slide, is like trying to localize at the, you know, h in position and h in momentum. And the fractal uncertainty principle is delta x times, sorry, the uncertainty principle is delta x times delta xi is at least h. So that would be violated. It's too much, too much localization. And the way it's manifested is if you use this porosity property and this tool, a fractal uncertainty principle, I'll present in a moment, then you can actually see that the product of these two operators actually has small L2 to L2 norm. So that quantifies the fact that nothing can be localized on both of these black sets at once. If you thought of, say, one of these as, you know, as, as the position frequency space. All right. And so once, once this happened, then you see that you wrote your U as something controlled plus something small. And that's what we needed to do anyway. So you somehow, you, the previous slide used a lot of uh, microlocal analysis and propagation for a long time. Used the fact that u is an eigenfunction to write u as this thing plus something that's controlled. And it turns out that at this point, you stop using that u as an eigenfunction. You just use the fact that the way you try to localize it here gives you something with a very small norm. And so this, this really, you know, it, it falls out. And that finishes the proof of the theorem. All right. So, um, yeah. So how does this fractal uncertainty principle work? So this is uh, what was promised here. Well, I will uh, state it, but in a simplified setting. So you could do all this up to the nth time, right? Right, and it's kind of a funnier nth time. So it's, it's really, you can see that the sets are very anisotropic. So very smooth in one direction, but a very rough like scale h in the other direction. The traditional approach of quantum chaos would be to localize to h 1 half in both directions. <laughs> Yeah, 
you have to go to logarithmic time. You have to go to at least strictly bigger than one half log of one over h, because if the intersection of these two sets contained a ball of radius h one half, then you would have a Gaussian that would localize in both position and frequency on these sets. So you really have to go far, and unfortunately, the, the suffering that re results from that is you need to develop a calculus for these operators, but it, it pays off because you can prove an, a new result using that uh, this way. So how do I explain this fractal uncertainty principle? Well, I'm going to simplify the setting. I'm going to remove the flow in the dire dilation direction in my, in my STRM. So I'm going to make it instead of four-dimensional phase space, I'm going to make it just two-dimensional. And then I'm going to pretend that my stable direction was the uh, vertical direction. The unstable one was the horizontal one. And so then this picture, I can, I'll replace localization, the stable direction, by just localization position, which is just an in indicator function, multiplication by indicator function of some fractal set, or some porous set, which is here the definition of porosity. And then localization, the unstable direction, I'll replace it by localization frequency. You, of course, this reduction needs to be carried out, but it actually reduces to this question. And localization frequency is done using this unitary semi-classical Fourier transform. Now, when you multiply these two localizations, this thing is unitary, so you really get this neat looking norm where you have the semi-classical Fourier transform and it wedged between two uh, multiplications by indicator functions of porous sets. So here is a theorem. So this theorem, unlike most things on the slides, is actually true as stated with no uh, asterisks or caveats. So assume that we're given two sets, which are new porous for some new up to scale h. And let's say they lie in the interval 0, 1, for simplicity. Then if I look at this sandwich, where I take this uh, Fourier transform and sandwich it between these two indicator functions, then the operator norm of that on L2 is O large of h to the beta, where beta is positive and depends only on the porosity constant. So that's the statement that's needed to uh, prove the theorem that uh, was in the beginning. Now, if you stare at this statement, there's nothing, you know, th th there isn't much microlocal, and certainly th there doesn't seem to be much of quantum chaos in this statement. And indeed, the way it's proved has nothing to do with what I talked about before. So I'm not going to give a proof. It will be given uh, 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 during the second talk tomorrow uh, morning, if uh, I'm interested in seeing the details. But this is a harmonic analysis statement. This is really a statement that if the Fourier transform had support of a function, has support in a certain porous set, then when you restrict this function position to another porous set, you get something that's very small. And so that's proved using a classical harmonic analysis. In particular, the berlin maliavin theorem uh, turns out to be very useful in establishing it. So it's really the, the statement itself is used in quantum chaos, but the proof, however, is uh, completely perpendicular to whatever was Are discussed you before. Uh, no. Well, okay. I can. I can. But it's, uh, yes, but, um, but then, of course, the next question will be how, how is it related? <laughs> it's, um, you are improving over the unitary, uh, unitarity of the Fourier transform. You say, if I had a Fourier restriction, uh, okay, Fourier restriction is, uh, is a term uh, copyrighted by some other people, but if you, if you are Fourier, uh, transform was supported inside uh, inside a fractal set, then your thing is small on this other set Y. Well, the total mass is of course preserved. So what you need to do is instead of establishing upper bounds on the set Y, you establish lower bounds on its complement, which has a lot of intervals. And so it becomes the following question that if you have a function whose Fourier transform is supported in a fractal set in a porous set, then you can get lower bounds on intervals on this function. Well, having lower bounds on intervals has to do with a quasi-analyticity property. So that's something, if your Fourier transform was just supported in, say, minus 1, 1, that's immediate because your function is real analytic, and then you have lower bound on all the intervals you want. So here, what the berlin maliavin theorem that I, I, I can't state it, but what it really does is it makes it possible for you to construct a compactly supported function with a lot of Fourier decay, but only on a porous set. And convolving with this function makes it possible for you to push into somehow into a class which is quasi-analytic, where you have lower bounds and intervals. So that's not, that's really not a very fair, um, this is really, really not, not very fair to my, 
that is a very one-dimensional statement, yes. So that's really, really unfair to my collaborator to uh, say, 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 simplify the proof that way. But that's, if you want it you know, in one minute, that, 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 that's the gist of uh, what happens. So, you, uh, so that's where the berling malyavan theorem comes up. So it's really classical harmonic analysis. All right. So I have a tiny bit of time, about the, actually the same amount of time as Stefan did when he got to spectral gaps. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about another application of this technology now to open quantum chaos. So here I'll go somewhat fast. So before we considered compact hyperbolic surfaces, now let's consider convex co-compact hyperbolic surfaces, which look nothing like compact ones. Well, look very different to me at least, which is it's a hyperbolic surface, but it has infinite ends, and the infinite ends are funnels. So here is an example of, uh, of it. It's a three-funnel surface. And on the left, it's a picture from a paper. So that's a good example of too, too much information. This is your assembly instructions. So if you know a tiny bit of Teichmuller theory, then you, you can look at this picture. This is the hyperbolic disk. This is a picture how you would sew your own three-funnel surface. <laughs> So, all right, so it's, it's a very concrete kind of object. Now, uh, what are we studying for these? Well, the, there is no discrete spectrum of the Laplacian, except in 0, 1 quarter. So there is a, what, what happens is the L2 spectrum of the Laplacian consists of some eigenvalues, potentially, and this continuous spectrum that starts at a quarter. Now, what we study, however, is not really the continuous spectrum as much as resonances. So how are they obtained? Well, you shift this one quarter to zero, and then you replace your spectral parameter with lambda square plus one quarter. So what this does is this red line unwraps like that. So the L2 resolvent is defined on this, uh, in, in, on this graph, is defined everywhere on all of these white lines, because that's outside of the L2 spectrum. Well, that goes to the upper half plane. And then if you think of your L2 resolvent instead of mapping compactly supported to locally L2 functions, then you actually have a meromorphic continuation to the lower half plane. And this gets poles, which are called resonances. And so that's the closest we have to discrete spectrum for, the <coughs> for these non-compact cases. The price to pay is these are complex numbers now, genuinely complex. They don't lie on any specific line. <clears throat> so this is the uh, picture here. Now, um, let's see. So I say that my uh, surface has an essential spectral gap of some size. If there is a half plane, so if you, if you have only finitely many resonances, basically in a strip, maybe on this picture, you can go a little bit below the place where you did your meromorphic continuation and you will get a strip with, let's say, only finitely many resonances. All right. So of course, that's a good, uh, you know, why, 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 why would we study something like that? Well, I'll just mention a few applications. So it turns out that, um, you know, I always use this analogy. It's a correct analogy, but um, for various reasons, you know, pe people might take exception to it. You know, wh why do we care about the Riemann hypothesis? Because having a zero free strip for the Riemann zeta function would give you better remainder in prime, uh, in prime number theorem, right? Well, it's one application, it's the original one. So here, it's a similar argument in spirit, which show that if you have no resonances with imaginary parts up to minus beta, then the linear waves when, uh, you know, when, uh, when, when cut off by compactly supported functions will actually be exponentially decaying. So somehow you have very strong dispersion on your manifold. And if you have finitely many, you can write an explicit expansion in terms of these resonances where each resonance would give you a certain oscillating and exponentially decaying term. And the imaginary part of the resonance would correspond to the rate of exponential decay. So the deeper the resonance is, the more exponentially decaying you get. So effectively, the spectral gap gives a lower bound on the rate of exponential decay of the solutions to the wave equation. <laughs> and there are also connections uh, which are related to this one, to uh, Strichardt's estimates, and a connection through the um, so Selberg's zeta function through the fact that hyperbolic surfaces just come up in so many different ways. In fact, you can also get exponential remainders de depending on the numerology here. So I'm not going to really do justice to that field either. 
you can get exponential remainders in Diophantine counting problems. So that's something uh, wor worth looking for. So uh, let me just mention some previous results. So to each surface is associated this key parameter delta, which for interesting cases is between 0 and 1. And that's the dimension of the limit set. It's related to the topological pressure that was explained. But somehow, if a surface is almost compact, see, if these funnels are very narrow, then delta is almost 1. If a surface is very open and somehow very easy for energy to escape, then delta is almost 0. And the pressure condition will be delta less than a half. So under this pressure condition, delta less than a half, Patterson and Sullivan actually showed that there is a gap of size 1 half minus delta. And then Federic No improved this to strictly bigger than 1 half minus delta using techniques that originated in the work of Dolgopiat. It somehow acquired a significant uh, advance be, you know, on, uh, relative to these results. So that's what was uh, previously known. So, OK, so here's a theorem. So we had this question, do you or do you not have a pressure gap? And the picture was like this. This is the dimension. This is my size of the gap, which I actually, for a good reason, called also beta. And that's what uh, was known before. This is the patterson sullivan gap. This is the trivial one, if you want. Uh, Noah proved um, this, that if you, you, you can improve over that all the way to 1 half in a way that depends on the surface somehow. So uh, the theorem here states that in all the remaining cases, you also have a gap. So in fact, uh, the pressure condition is not needed to establish exponential decay or to establish spectral gap for these systems. And so this uh, statement actually makes one optimistic that maybe the, uh, you know, the, the pressure condition is actually never necessary in the sense that just being a hyperbolic, uh, you know, just being hyperbolic is enough to establish a spectral gap. So I'll mention that. So here is some uh, quick numerics by uh, Borthuk and Weish. These are the actual sizes of the, well, actual, numerically approximate. Different people have different, you know, you're approximating something goes to infinity. So it's, um, but anyway, uh, uh, here on this graph, and then uh, with the standard gap. So you can see that indeed, at least so far, that the gap that, 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 that doesn't seem to be, you know, doesn't seem to be zero for what it's worth. And the proof also uses the same fractal uncertainty principle effectively. But this time, this gamma plus minus are sets of geodesics. So instead of not passing through the hole, you require that they are trapped. So they stay in this convex core of a manifold for a long time. All right. So let me just spend uh, one more minute to talk about somehow the, uh, you know, what, what's, what's not known. So I presented a um, couple of results. Um, so where can we go from here as far as this technology is concerned? Well, you can see that these results, for instance, they are in uh, the setting of hyperbolic surfaces, so surfaces of constant negative curvature. And there are certain important technical reasons why the proof doesn't so far apply to the setting of, say, variable negative curvature or the setting of more general and more natural from an open quantum case point of view or from, from a quantum chaotic point of view of just manifolds whose geodesic flows are either on OSF or hyperbolic D depending whether it's an open or closed setting. So somehow the uh, assumption that you have a, uh, you, that you have a constant negative curvature is it makes your life nice, but it's also quite restrictive. <clears throat> and there is nothing in the strategy of the proof that absolutely prevents this from applying to negative curvature. So can we somehow overcome the, the, the difficulties arising and uh, see that <coughs> you can actually uh, say something about general dynamics. Yes? Uh, no, actually, a uh, unique organization of geodesic uh, of, of the uh, horocyclic flows is, is true in, you know, for any uh, hyperbolic system. No, it arises because the stable and unstable decomposition is not smooth. So that's, that's where the problem is. But that's a question whether it's a technical problem or not. Because you know, I would like to make conjectures like, any negatively curved uh, manifold, in fact, you know, in any open non-empty set, you have a lower bound on eigenfunctions, or that there is a spectral gap for any hyperbolic system. As, as soon as you open it a tiny bit, there is some opportunity to escape. I believe there should be a spectral gap. So, you know. <coughs> uh, it appears when you try to quantize observables. 
it's kind of it's difficult. The, the way the observables is quantized depends on the fact that we have smooth, uh, stable, and stable foliations. Sh showing porosity itself is uh, is a more or less robust statement. In fact, that's uh, uh, then the other thing is that, as was pointed out before, this fractal uncertainty principle was done using very one-dimensional methods. So can it be extended using other methods? Or what, what can we say for higher dimensional manifolds or fractal uncertainty in dimension higher than 1? So let's say in, in R2. And then what also happens is that the exponent here and the size of the gap can actually be extremely small, or at least the bounds that we get are very small. And so can we get? better fractal uncertainty principle exponent and thus better lower bounds on the mass in a given a small open set of eigenfunction or lower bound on the size of the spectral gap if we chose our system in a generic way, whatever this means. So these are some of the uh, questions that we will um, try to discuss this week. Uh, and that's it. Thank you for your attention.